to Tokyo, you could see two fireflies. This is how good uh, the resolution of this telescope is. Hubble's optics capture detailed images of blue stragglers, allowing scientists unprecedented access to their secrets. So by looking at these individual stars, it was able then to measure the properties of these stars, for example, their mass, how fast they rotate, their temperature, and things like that. Astronomers discovered the blue straggler's high mass, fast rate of spin, and high temperature could only mean one thing. A blue straggler, we think today, is uh, most likely the result of a merger of two stars. Uh, and those mergers could have happened via collisions, direct collisions, two stars colliding with each other, or two stars that were in a binary system where they rotate around their center of gravity. In one example, a main sequence star plows into another at about a half a million miles per hour. It burrows into the other star, setting off a wave of gas and debris into space. Immediately, the stars will swell and ferociously burn energy. It can take 10 million years for the stars to overcome their violent merger and settle into a blue straggler. This was the first evidence that we had that stars really could collide with each other. And this is one of the more remarkable things that stars have been found to do. It took decades for the idea of stellar collisions to move from theory to full-blown reality. But where galactic collisions are concerned, slamming stars are just the tip of the iceberg. Cosmic collisions are the rule not the exception in the universe. And at every level, right down to the dust that wafts through space. In our own solar system, all the planets, all the objects that we see were built by collisions. Dust colliding to make sand, sand colliding to make pebbles, pebbles to rocks, boulders to planetesimals, asteroids to planets. So our own origins are from collisions. Galaxies can be violent places, the locus of death, birth, and rebirth. Galaxies collide, and so do stars within galaxies. But are there other objects that can go bump in the night? And what would lead astronomers to name something the Death Star Galaxy? Let's hope the Force is with us. Cosmic collisions aren't limited to large bodies crashing into each other. Sometimes a collision can occur with jets of energy, deadly energy. Lethal radiation spews out of a supermassive, mysterious object called a black hole, a quasar. The beam from what scientists have dubbed the Death Star Galaxy is slamming into a smaller neighboring galaxy. What's actually happening is a jet is coming out of one black hole and it accelerates close to the speed of light, and that jet strikes a companion galaxy that's swung into the path of that jet, and that wreaks all sorts of havoc for any inhabitants or any Earth-like planets in that companion galaxy. The ones that are close enough would be sterilized. The ones a little bit further out would have their atmospheres damaged. These are the really extraordinarily acts of violence by a supermassive black hole. It sounds like science fiction, but it's science fact. Luckily for our galaxy, this cataclysm is taking place in galaxy 3C321, a galaxy far, far away, 1.4 billion light years distant. This is the first time astronomers have observed a black hole jet punching into a companion galaxy. But this event raises many questions, beginning with what is a black hole? And are we Earthlings in danger from a death ray? Black holes aren't really holes at all, but instead are incredibly dense and massive objects. Black holes are so dense, their gravitational pull so strong that nothing can escape them, not even light itself. It takes observations from multiple telescopes to make a complete picture of this unique phenomenon. It's only by combining information right across the electromagnetic spectrum that we can begin to study black holes with great precision. Part of that picture was taken at this telescope, the VLA, or Very Large Array, in New Mexico. The VLA is a radio telescope 
made up of 27 dish antennas, each one of them weighing 230 tons. The antennas are arranged in the shape of a Y, and each arm of that Y is 13 miles long. The VLA is especially adept at observing black holes, such as the one in our own galaxy. That thing is about four million times more massive than the sun, and it creates all kinds of phenomena, but gas and dust between us and that black hole obscures all of that to visible light telescopes. The VLA's ability to detect radio waves allows it to better penetrate the stellar debris. So radio telescopes and infrared telescopes are really the only way to study that. Just like a, a visible light telescope is collecting light waves to make an image, we're collecting radio waves to make an image. Optical and short wavelength radio cannot see into the inner parts of these regions. Radio can. And radio astronomers of long wavelengths, such as this facility, can peer into the inner parts of these regions that are obscured to other wave bands. Most galaxies have supermassive black holes at their centers. They can be one million to one billion times the mass of our sun. Despite their mass, we initially couldn't see black holes. So how did we eventually know they were there? As material flows in towards a black hole, it's much like water going down a bath plug. It goes down, and it spins around. And essentially through frictional forces, that friction generates heat and it generates light. And that light is so intense and so energetic that it forms X-rays. It was the disappearance of objects in this drain that led 18th century astronomers to suggest the existence of an invisible star. In 1783, the Reverend John Mitchell laid out beautifully the idea of an event horizon. Mitchell showed that a body that's very massive with a small enough radius would have an escape velocity that is the speed of light. It would trap the light and be invisible, be dark. That is the idea of the event horizon. John Wheeler, a close collaborator of Albert Einstein's, coined the phrase black hole in 1967. It was then still a theory. Scientists hadn't even realized that they had already found their first black hole. The evidence was X-rays, invisible energy produced by black holes. In 1971, the X-ray source was identified with a very massive giant blue star. Later in 1971, we were all startled to find that this optical star that was so massive was orbiting the X-ray source at a very high velocity. This high velocity means that the X-ray source is more massive than three times the mass of our sun. This essentially established it to be a black hole. Probably the biggest boon to the study of black holes came in the form of another of NASA's great observatories, the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We've often been asked, why don't we do X-ray astronomy from the ground? Because, of course, it's, it's riskier, more expensive, and challenging to put your telescope up into space. The Earth's atmosphere is actually uh, uh, very opaque to X-rays. It blots out all the X-rays that come from stars and galaxies that are far off. So we want to do X-ray astronomy, we have to go into space. And Chandra is the most capable X-ray telescope that we've had. Chandra is uh, particularly uh, suited for studying places and objects in the universe where violent conditions, extreme conditions, generate X-rays as a primary signature. We're talking about, for example, matter falling into a black hole, uh, stars exploding as supernovae, or galaxies colliding. And it's this kind of cosmic violence that Chandra's particularly adept at studying. X-rays are present whenever a celestial object produces large amounts of heat. Neutron stars and black holes can create X-rays 100,000 times the strength of the X-rays the sun produces. Chandra was pivotal in helping astronomers understand what's occurring in the Death Star galaxy. So Chandra allowed us to see the central black hole sources. It allowed us to determine the uh, presence of this X-ray jet. 
And it's this jet that uh, gave uh, rise to the name of the Death Star Galaxy because the jet points directly uh, in the direction of the companion galaxy and you can actually see the effects of that radiated beam of energy and particles as it hits the neighboring or companion galaxy. Like most cosmic collisions, there's a silver lining. Once the Death Star jet has devastated the nearby galaxy, it will likely unleash a new round of star and planet formations. It's all part of the universe's cycle of life and death. Black holes aren't necessarily these cosmic cannonballs. They don't necessarily run through the universe, sucking up everything in their path. In fact, one of the ultimate legacies of black holes could actually lead to the creation as well as destruction of life. Our solar system has managed to avoid death rays only to be thrust into a galactic calamity of staggering proportions. In the distant future, our galaxy, the Milky Way, and its neighbor, Andromeda, will collide. But will this collision be a source of creation or destruction? We're on a collision course. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, and our closest neighbor, Andromeda, are rushing toward each other at 270,000 miles per hour. But what could a galactic collision like this mean? It turns out that the greatest danger comes from collisions with those thermonuclear reactors, also known as stars. If a star comes sufficiently close to the solar system, it may send comets in our way. If it comes even closer, it may disturb the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so life as we know it will cease to exist because either all the water will get evaporated or else it would freeze if we are sent out away from the, the sun. The collision between the Milky Way and Andromeda was destined from the time in the early universe when these two galaxies were born side by side. Things that merge are born bound and eventually come together. Things that are born unbound generally don't merge, they just separate. Most galaxies are diverging in the expanding universe. And all galaxies, it turns out, that are far away from us will recede away from us and disappear from view within a finite amount of time. The only exception is the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest neighbor, our sister galaxy. Andromeda and Milky Way, their gravity has actually, at some point in the past, reversed any receding velocity between the two of them and they're now approaching one another because of that mutual attraction. We're actually on a collision course. Seem to be coming straight at each other and it's looking pretty, it's looking pretty bad for us. The Andromeda galaxy, within about five billion years, will collide with the Milky Way galaxy. But what's the evidence of this coming collision? It turns out that the light signatures that Andromeda gives off are the strongest evidence of its approach. It's the same stuff that makes the fireworks colorful. You look for a particular color and you know it's coming from iron or oxygen or sulfur or something and you know what color it should be and then you just see what color it seems to be. Is it bluer or redder? If it's bluer, it's most probably because it's coming straight at you and if it's redder, it's because it's going further away. You look at Andromeda and it's blue shifted uh, and the speed at which it has to be moving is a few hundred kilometers per second. So it's coming at us and coming at us fast. But wait. A collision that destroys life on Earth is only one possible scenario, and not at all the most likely one. So what will actually happen in two billion years when these two galaxies begin to approach each other? Because galaxies are incredibly massive and the distances between them so great, a collision takes billions of years from start to finish. As a result, astronomers can only observe snapshots in the sky. To understand the whole process, they rely on simulations. Every snapshot we get of a galaxy collision in the universe is really just one piece of a very long sequence. And so these simulations allow you to piece together the various situations and see how it develops from approach to passing by, to the tidal tails, to smashing together, to mixing all up. In the 1970s, astrophysicists and brothers Alar and Yuri Tumre created the first simulations of colliding spiral galaxies. Their simulations duplicated features that have since been observed in colliding galaxies. Their sequence detailing the steps from galactic approach through merger 
has become known as the Tomb Ray Sequence. Today, Frank Summers, an astrophysicist at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, uses state-of-the-art visual effects programs and banks of computers to compress galactic collisions into simulations depicting 10 million years of galactic action per second. It all starts with the approach, two spiral galaxies draw near to each other. You can see here that just before they start to crash, there really isn't any tidal distortion, which I thought was really strange when I looked at the visualization. Right, they're still pretty symmetric there. It's only when you kind of start sending out these tidal tails that they would be put into the tomb ray sequence. Okay. Uh, and then you can kind of watch as it comes along here. Um, they start kind of uh, first pass and then they come back together. The simulation shows the tremendous gravitational attraction between colliding spiral galaxies. Vast strings of stars and gases, known as tidal tails, are thrown out into distant space. This dramatic stage can be verified by images of colliding galaxies, like the antennae galaxies and the mice. Astronomers predict that the Andromeda-Milky Way collision will progress with the same shearing stage. The tidal tails are basically the outskirts of the Milky Way being ripped apart. The Milky Way is a thin, fairly fragile, delicate galaxy. And the Andromeda is actually bigger than we are and more massive. And when it zooms past us originally, its gravitational field is going to tear at the Milky Way. But as the two galaxies come together in two billion years, their approach will look less like a collision and more like the swing of a pendulum, momentum carrying the galaxies past each other and gravity drawing them back. They'll keep on moving because of all this momentum they've built up. And as they move apart from one another now, the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy will start to slow down because of the gravitational attraction between them. The recessional velocity will decrease, decrease, until ultimately they turn around and come back for another passage past one another. Four and a half billion years from now, once again the galaxies swing toward each other. This time, it will be a direct hit these beautiful disk structures of these two spiral galaxies are probably going to get totally destroyed. They'll be pulled out into these long tidal tails, and then when they come smashing together, well, the orbits of all the stars will randomize, and what you're going to end up with is more of an elliptical shape in the center, and these big long tidal tails that'll come raining back in over the course of billions of years. The collision has become a merger. And then the central parts here um, are now merging together, and now you have just a central, kind of one single galaxy at the center. And so the outer tidal tails would kind of dilute, and you'd come back in another, uh, you know, half a billion years or so, and you'd see one galaxy. You can see how they merge together here, and so now you really have essentially one core. Um, you still have some tidal tails, those will tend to fade with time, and so if we take this a little bit farther out there, we would think we have just one object and it would look pretty much like an elliptical galaxy at that point. Astronomers speculate that the elliptical galaxies in the universe are the product of galactic collisions like these. But what actually happens inside colliding galaxies as they go through this violent process? And what does it mean for our planet as we endure the cataclysm? The images of colliding galaxies are ethereal. Tidal tails stretch out like spider webs. Galactic cores orbit each other locked in attraction. But do these beautiful images mask wholesale destruction? Stars slamming into each other, planets crashing, moons atomized into space dust. One of the coolest things about galaxy collisions is that when these huge galaxies smash together, the stars don't. If you take a star and another star, the distances between them are millions of times larger than the diameters of the stars. And during this galactic collision and ultimate merger, what are the chances that Earth will be smashed to bits? According to astronomers, quite low. Each star has a, something like the solar system around it. Even the space between those is very, very large, such that the probability of even one planet colliding with another is negligible. But that doesn't mean that Earth is entirely off the hook. So somewhere around a 10% chance or so 
that the Earth would get ejected with the Sun and the solar system um, in one of these tidal tails. And then we would be far away and we'd sort of have, you know, a bird's eye view of our galaxy. So really